one of the core topics of crypto is privacy. Because ironically, with Bitcoin, all transactions are traceable and trackable. So if you send someone Bitcoin, they can scan your wallet to see where your funds are coming from and where you're spending your funds, which is highly undesirable. So we looked at, in the past, cryptocurrencies like Monero, which uses ring signatures to hide the amount transferred and where it's going to. But in this sponsored video, we're going to take a look at the Dusk Network, where they built kind of privacy from the ground up using bulletproof technology. They also have a different consensus mechanism called Segregated Byzantine Agreement. Yes, that's a mouthful, but what it means is that it uses a voting process to select incentivized nodes and to reach finality. So we explore in quite a bit of detail why the privacy is needed. I also learned that privacy is required for security token offerings in the European Union in order to comply with GDPR, which I didn't expect because I thought governments would hate privacy, but actually it's quite necessary. So we explore in quite a lot of detail of how this is done. I hope you guys can challenge yourselves to kind of hear the ideas being put forth because this definitely has huge implications in the current in the blockchain space. Hey guys, and welcome back to my channel. So today we have Emmanuel and Yella from the Desk Network. And we're here just to casually chat a little bit about everything that's going on in the blockchain space and also talk to them about what they're doing as well in their project Dusk. So Yella, can you give me a slight introduction of you know, who you are and why you're still developing in this bear market? <laughs> yeah, pleasure. Uh, so I'm Yella Paul, uh, business lead at Dusk Network. Uh, previously worked in uh, renewable energy, IT, but always uh, more on the business side. I moved into blockchain full time uh, quite a while ago now. This was before Dusk, and uh, it was a company that would, uh, you know, provide services for uh, a mid-sized organization to decentralize centralized infrastructure. And that is how I met. I met Yelle. We were hired in order to decentralize a network infrastructure. We just started from the enterprise angle, the hyperledgers, the Cordas, the you know the Ethereum Enterprise Alliance, that kind of stuff, and then slowly started gravitating more and more towards the kind of public or permissionless sector. So, so what attracts you about public kind of blockchains? Um, you know, you've been working in a big corporation <laughs> for a long time. Uh, yeah. Why, why leave that space? I just really felt much more drawn to the space where um, I, couldn't, yeah, I could focus on building what I think uh, made sense in the space rather than what gave the company I was working for the most kind of cost savings, if you know what I mean. So, nice. yeah. uh, Now, how did you guys start Dusk? Like, how do you guys come up with this idea? We actually, we actually came up with, uh, with the idea when we were uh, working for this, uh, for this particular organization, which shall remain nameless of course but from a technical <laughs> perspective um we didn't really want to reinvent the wheel we wanted to uh, offer to our former client um a way to decentralize its own infrastructure and they wanted it to be secure and to be private and mm -hmm. there's nothing <laughs> out there uh that 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 actually y you could you could use for that in order to have a trustless permissionless and blockchain based exchange of data or uh, transactions if you want then the closest you have is uh, a smart contract platform but normally they are not private so that's one of the advantages so, so you're trying to say okay let's target privacy let's target this communication network for its bi communicate um, direction communication what kind of systems would use this bi-directional because like you know we got monero for payments Bidirectional exchange, right? So this is where Nero, for example, is lacking. You can do some of this on top of Ethereum. And then there's a kind of third type, as Emanuela briefly mentioned, called Time Unbound, which is basically streaming. So it's a bidirectional exchange, but you don't know when it's going to end, right? We offer all these types of transactions, and the Time Unbound is, is conceptually easy to understand. You use it for data streaming, a call like this, for example. And it makes sense why you could want confidentiality in, the, in, in that sense. And so digital assets, for example, are a good example where you um, trade some type of digital asset for a currency or a different type of asset. Uh, and we see here that, for example, when you look at the secondary market, there's a lot of 
gains to be made, either when you compare kind of the real world to what we can do when we apply blockchain to it, and especially into the current state of the blockchain space here and, and how we can improve on that. The space is where a potential subset of that is, for example, the security tokens we briefly talked about before. So you're talking about adding additional kind of uh, methods of communication. And how did you design your blockchain to be like this? Okay, so you have a specific um, two targets. How do you how did you do it, and you know how is it different? Then we are talking about uh, asset exchange that right now are happening digitally all the time in a regulated way. Who makes these rules? Who are the regulators? Well, the regulators are policymakers. Then normally they belong to 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 a government that issue policies in several different other several different other fields for example the environmental protection field so anything that fits a, reg a regulatory framework is done by the same people or at least by the same uh, context creating this particular technological uh, proposition on top of proof of work for example is immediately frowned upon by by any serious regulator at the same time um there are a, there is a lot of there is kind of a conundrum when whenever you're talking about confidentiality or privacy because people immediately think that regulators are against confidentiality that they want everything in clear that they want to look at the open ledger that they want to audit transactions couldn't really be really farthest from the truth uh, regulators actually want a, a high degree of privacy, uh, but at the same time, we've been hearing the counter argument as well, where they want traceability as well. So is there a balance of that um, in the system that you guys are designing? But the interesting point is that the auditability normally happens uh, not really on the nature of the transaction itself, but more on whom are transacting. Right? So if you have transaction confidentiality, among transactors that you know you can prove have been authorized have been allowed to transact inside of the network while the issuer still keeps the the, the same old uh, uh, you know whitelist registry and all the transactors have been going or undergoing the KYC and AML and the regulators are are absolutely fine. And this is proven in zero knowledge using um, quite a different setup based on what is called bulletproof technology. Use a completely different consensus methodology that we created. It's called mm -hmm. segregation in agreement. And is sort of, well, colloquially, you, you can you can call it proof of blind bead. In the traditional markets, um, if there is and problem with the AML KYC because it doesn't mean, okay, so uh, it doesn't mean just, oh, a whitelist is a done deal. If you do something bad, they can, you know, go and look up these records. But in this case, you cannot with us because, or, or, or can you, you know, that's my question I ask. No, the, the, the short answer is it's not possible. However, there isn't really anything that you can do that is shady on that particular, on a certain particular uh, Trading. Well, also for tax reasons. Let's say, let's say, let's say there's a tax audit. You must, you know, prove um, your capital gains, and you made these trades at a certain time. And that's that's a, a government request. Something happens, and um, you must prove that this is the case. Um, is that possible with Dusk, or do we need to rely on something else? Uh, at some point, you you have a certain particular uh, demand for liquidity, right? So uh, transactions are different than gains. Transactions are different than, uh, than basically pegging toward fiat or anything else. It's basically something like, I want a certain particular security. This security or this uh, stock or this uh, financial product gives me a certain uh, ROI. We are talking about real asset here. And all of these is encoded inside of a, uh, inside of a prospectus, which is then translated into a zero knowledge smart contract, but it's, it's still a prospectus, right? So what we do with Dusk is to force, uh, in a trustless way, this prospectus and to force the network 
for the, the you know, everything that has got to do with this protocol to abide by this prospectus, which means that nothing outside of this prospectus can, can, can happen. Mm -hmm. uh, to give you an example, if it, is, uh, if it is illegal for me and you to transact for more than 10 million in a certain particular asset, this is going to be encoded directly in the, uh, in the rules that, that uh, govern uh, the transactions inside of, inside of DAS. Okay. Uh, let's say there's a set of rules uh, for trades, right? So I, I think this is a really good example because let's say you send me, so the max that we can send is 10 million. You send me 5 million. All right, and then you send me another five million, and then the th um the but the third time that should be illegal, right? Uh, let's say the third time you send me another five million, that should be not allowed because of think a little bit in a bi-directional way. So if I am saying I am giving you five million, it means that I'm getting something in returns. So normally, what you're getting in returns are are assets. So if the encoding says that the encoding is never going to say something like, well, there cannot be more than 10 million transacted, but there will definitely say any single wallet cannot really uh, be associated of more than 10% of a certain particular of a certain particular equity. Uh, and at that particular point in time, the zero knowledge proof that somebody, without really revealing, re, without really relieve, uh, revealing what is the uh, what is the the account or what is the balance of of the all the different wallet, mm -hmm. I can prove you, uh, and you need to prove to the entire network that by having that particular transaction, your account or your balance is not going to overflow. What is uh, okay. Right, so yeah. it's this bi-direction bi bi communication, which is really important. So it's not like, oh, uh, you send and then I send. It's like, okay, let's, uh, let's check if this is possible for the send to happen. And then it's a bi-directional at the same time, boom. And then you can reveal um, the set of information. You can reveal that uh, certain conditions are met without actually yeah. revealing the amount of assets. You can, you, you can reveal and prove the correctness of what you've done without disclosing the actual information about the amounts or the, or, or, or the players, right? And, uh... Okay, so cool. So you can run smart contracts. You can, um, these smart contracts and make sure various parameters are met with zero knowledge proof and, or uh, without actually revealing the information. So that's why you say, okay, look, this is a great application use case. STOs are a use case on top of the dust network because, well, it has um, a set of properties that um, can um, help um, regulators and preserve privacy at the same time. Okay. Yeah. yeah so, so it's a mix of regulatory compliance and also of the actual requirements by the businesses and users, right? So it's kind of, you have to build it for both. Okay. Um, how, 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 does the, how does the segregated Byzantine agreement work um, to deal with this? Well, first of all, you have two different roles instead of the network, right? So one is the block generator role. Uh, every account can place a bid, right? So this bid is a blind bid. You do not, re it's, a, it's a confidential transaction. You do not really know what has been uh, bidden. But this bid affects a certain score, hmm, which determines if this particular account is selected or the block that is propagated in the network by that particular account is, um, you know, selected. And then what you need to do is to, is to prove that this particular selection happened, that the bid was, uh, was yours, and that the score was honestly computed according to the bid. And then the highest score emerges as the winner. So um, all the, the different nodes, they, have, they run this non-interactive lottery um, through a, a VRF, a verifiable random function. And then they see if the score that they obtain is higher than the score that starts to basically, they start to collect. If it is not, then they stop propagating their own and they start propagating mm -hmm. on the highest. Yeah, it's fun. Until okay. it gets to a set or a committee of voters, which is called provisioners, and the provisioners basically perform a reduction, so which is the block that they get associated to the highest score, proven in zero knowledge that is honestly uh, produced, or the um, or the uh, the um, uh, default empty block. So they vote, 
And then uh, as a result of the voting, as soon as basically they get to a quorum, then the block is notarized. Now, the fact that you have two different roles, it means that you can reward them differently. Voters do not produce blocks. A certain particular uh, economic reward, or they are rewarded uh, with a default amount and by participating in the voting system. Now, if the default amount is direct or inversely proportional to the stake that somebody has, then this automatically defeats staking centralization. Because the more you stake, the lesser your reward. At the same time, if the more you stake, the lesser your reward, it might be that you are uh, incentivized never to participate to, to, the voting, to the voting system or to dilute too much. So to dilute and to have, civil, uh, to have a civil attack. And that is also why we in introduce also a reward that is based on the operator. Um, but how can you tie this together? I mean, if it's the same machine, fine. But how do I tie the identities of these people? You said, okay, um, the more I stake, the less in terms of validation role I play. Um, how do I make sure that one nefarious party cannot gain a majority on both sides, block generation and valid validation? you cannot do both. So provisions, for example, are non-transactional. So they cannot transact. They are just uh, there to stake and to vote. And that's it. Block generators, in the other, on the other hand, they bid a certain particular amount. So they do not really stake. Also, the bid that they, that they, uh, that they can do is capped at some point. But, but um, I can just open, you know, uh, I could be like three block generators or you know, it can be like 400. I mean, this is what happened with Binance voting manipulation. Um, there was a max amount of what BNB can stake to vote, but then people just open multiple accounts. Block generator basically needs to, needs, to, needs to bid, right? So if you are diluting your own bid among different kind of, uh, different kind of nodes, then effectively you are diluting your probability of getting a, high, a higher score. You can think you can think of that as being sort of a scratch card, right? So you can cre you can buy as many as many scratch cards you want, and then you get a score that is probabilistically higher, and you bid uh, multiple times. Then you are effectively just uh, <laughs> just uh, harming yourself, harming your probabilities. If you have a lot to stake then it's uh, actually there, it's economically it's economically more uh, proficient for you to run a prov to run a provision or run uh, uh, rather than than basically uh, run the block the block generator with um Secretary Byzantine agreement we have two camps that um, are acting kind of independently from each other the generator and the validating and then you have the voting so we have the system in place that um, kind of it's quite a novel way of um, carrying out block generation. So um, it is novel, but not that novel. There are precedents. So mm -hmm. one of the most illustrious precedents is, uh, is Algorand, for example. Uh, but there are so many, so many differences with, uh, with Algorand that uh, basically business, segregated Byzantine agreement is something completely different. But uh, some of the uh, working uh, assumptions uh, tested in the Algorand blockchain still holds inside of segregated Byzantine agreement. And then how about transactions? I mean, obviously one of the problems that Ethereum ran into was scalability last year. How do you plan to scale such a system? In our case, uh, first of all, we aim to have a very, very good performance to begin with. Very quick finality of blocks through a, non a notarization procedure that is uh, that has been researched and uh, implemented for exactly for that particular purpose. But we do not really aim, or at least at this particular point in time, we do not really um, have utility uh, tokens on top of Dusk. We uh, think about hosting a certain number of communication proposition uh, and this is a strategic move but for the immediate for the immediate circumstances we aim at the sto market to, to be completely honest we are testing with several different configuration in order in order to have um, the optimal mm, trade-off between 
block times and uh, you know uh, network synchrony. As a matter of fact, um, are, are you going to allow smart contracts on the platform, or um, you know how how does that kind of fit into play? Like, are you going to allow? Uh, do you have your own kind of virtual machine, or is that? And we are going to create our own uh, virtual machine. As, uh, based on uh, WebAssembly because we want to be able to run it on uh, on any browser. The, the team that is going to do that is going to be led by one of the former senior uh, developer at Mozilla uh, that worked on mm. Firefox. His name is Matteo Ferretti, he lives here in Amsterdam. How do we build the community to develop on top of it or do you even want the community to develop on this? Do you want um, this to be um, you know, do you want STOs to develop their own code or do you want to provide a solution for it? What we want ideally for the platform or for the protocols is, is ultimately, like you mentioned, uh, third parties to build on top of it or people to start playing on their own, right? And there's a few things we're doing here. Uh, one of the big ones to mention is the XST standard, confidential security token, which we're basically setting up for security tokens on top of Dusk, very similar to what the ERC-20 was for ICOs on top of Ethereum, for example. So we're creating these standards so that people don't have to rely on us, right, the direct kind of Dusk team in order to, to, to create a successful security token. Now, what we're doing as an interim step is we've created a few STO incubators, which are basically versions of these third parties that will kickstart adoption, uh, get uh, third parties that want to issue an STO through the process, also with a bit of technical help, uh, so that it's kind of very comfortable go to market uh, for them. Now, this business is something that as the traction starts to increase, uh, we will kind of distance ourselves from again, right? This is really something you do as a, a period of training wheels, so to say. Um, and then, so we're the protocol layer, then you have a big issuance layer where you have the actual STOs and the companies and potentially third party providers that are, you know, you're the kind of typical uh, consultancy type uh, service provider. And then there's the secondary market, you know, regulated uh, or licensed security token exchanges, you name it. And we are kind of, meddling a little bit in that space but it's more from a perspective that we want the entire ecosystem to be kind of on the same timeline we've seen quite a lot of sto platforms we have like polymathics mm -hmm. for example is one they've been trying to create um just a simple token standard on on ethereum yeah. like you guys are building your own chain you know um how do you um how do you want to compete with that what how do you do you see that as competition or what, what do you see here this is the hard question no, yeah no no not directly because there's a few differences, right? And I'll just name one or two. Uh, so one of the big differences is that they've already built on top of Ethereum, right? So they're kind of a layer two application or platform or whatever you want to call it. This means that they inherently have to build around the quirks of the protocol that they chose, which in this case is Ethereum. So Ethereum, for example, doesn't really feature confidentiality. This means that they have to introduce their own workarounds. So the, for example, in their case, this is going off chain, proxies, custodians, you name it, right? So kind of reintroducing these centralized parties, which is going to hurt their scalability. Uh, and more importantly, le leads to one of the big other differentiators, which is a simple thing called cost. So because Polymath, their business model is the STO, right? Um, they uh, provide a service with a setup fee and a percentage of your security tokens and the mediation fees and proxy fees that are paid by the third party that is issuing like this third party they are the product uh, this means that they you know you're paying polymath and you're paying the other centralized parties in their kind of value chain the other kind of uh, validating parties uh, to do something for you. The difference with Dusk is that these security token issuing third parties, they are not the product, right? Our goal is to get the protocol adopted. Uh, and if a team is savvy enough to employ our token standard, then we are completely irrelevant in that process and it is completely free of cost, free of any charge, right? So not only is our protocol specifically suited for what they're trying to do, they don't have to introduce any workarounds, uh, we are also ultimately free to use and not productizing these third parties. Where do you think people should begin? You know, like where, you know, we have different legislations around the world. So where, where's the first way, um, region you, um, you want them to seek kind of compliance with or um, legal resistance, right? You, you start looking at the, the jurisdictions that are already much more forward thinking in the whole a cryptocurrency space and you use them as bridge hats to you know gain more traction in the in the kind of more uh, mature jurisdictions if you will so we see a lot of great work being done in malta of course but also in 
uh, lesser known jurisdictions, for example, like uh, San Marino, uh, Liechtenstein, there's great work going on in the UK. Um, and, and then there's various jurisdictions like these uh, that if you are starting from scratch, I would highly recommend. Obviously, if you've had, you know, I don't know, a few years in a certain jurisdiction or kind of a headquarters or a certain seat, uh, then it might always be worth um, you know, going through a little bit more legal work there uh, simply because it's a better company decision for you, right? But if you're starting from scratch, then I would definitely recommend uh, some of the jurisdictions I just mentioned. Okay, so um, you guys don't directly provide help apart from the incubation side? And yeah, then... So on the incubation side, there's also a legal aspect, right? But in that sense, we, 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 we're really setting us up as kind of a third party provider. So in Malta, for example, uh, an incubator is being set up and we have local advisors there and all the kind of local legal infrastructure uh, where, where we can kind of directly hold the hand of a company all the way from kind of analysis to legal, to tech, to fundraising, to issuance, really kind of end to end go to market uh, incubation assistance. Right. So you're kind of like a tour guide. You're like, hey, okay, here's, here's a bunch of oh, things. Yeah, we're really, yeah, exactly. And the goal is absolutely to get copied, right? So it, it's like not a traditional kind of business decision, I guess. But our goal is really to see, to say, okay, this is what we're going to provide. And it's going to be free because we want you building on top of Dusk. And this is the model. And we will tell the model to everyone that wants to know it. And uh, hopefully they see, oh, this is actually something pretty good going on. Uh, let's get into this business as well, right? And then they can have it all, right? So because the more parties that start adopting Dusk is the protocol of choice to build on top of, that is our goal, right? Our goal is not to make money mm -hmm. from these other businesses. So uh, my dream scenario would be if, uh, may, you know, a year from now, all of our incubators, we simply have given them away. They were no longer needed because, you know, there's all these other parties doing a great job in that space now. And then, you know, you completely refocus on the protocol. So it's really training wheels, as I said. Cool. Cool. Okay. So um, you're really actually pushing this out um, quite quickly. So Q2 of 2019. Um, and then of course, after that, um, uh, people can actually just access it and feel free to develop it for it as well. So, you know, Yella and Emmanuel, thank you guys so much for coming on this interview. And Emmanuel, thank you so much for telling me to uh, think in a bi-directional manner. I think that's <laughs> actually something that it's the first time I really, you know, thought about this um, like this, but I think it's, it's amazing to, to, to pick your mind at a certain thing. So thank you guys so much for your time. Um, of course, to get to know your project a little bit better, how do we contact you? What's the best way to contact you guys? So yeah, there's many different ways. And uh, I guess we can link it on the video in the description. You can get to our website, it's dusk.network. And then after that, we are extremely uh, active on Telegram, Medium, uh, and Twitter are probably the main ones. And you can find all of those on the, on the website. And we're in our channels regularly. So come say hi ask us uh, all the good follow-up questions and uh, we'll try to, uh, to be with you. <laughs> awesome. Thank you guys so much for your time, man.